Good morning and welcome to the Energy Prospectus webinar hosted by E3 Metals Corp. This event will be recorded. During the presentation, all participants will be muted. If you have any questions you would like to ask the speaker, please type them into the chat feature. We will read and answer questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now here's Dan Steffens who will introduce today's speaker. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us and welcome to all of you. Uh, we have quite a few non-EPG members on uh, the webinar today. Um, so I want to uh, let y'all know that if you're interested in what the Energy Prospectus Group does, it was formed in 2006 and our focus is on energy and we're we're interested in all forms of energy. So not just, uh, we spend a lot of time on oil and gas, but we're also looking at uh, companies that should do really well in, as the world transitions to more, um, you know, electric motors than uh, internal combustion. So if you want to find out what we do and are and become a subscriber to our service, just send an email to Sabrina at energy prospectus at gmail.com and she will contact you. Uh, you can also find us on the web at just energyprospectus.com or Google Energy Prospectus and it'll go there. Uh, we already have two pages of questions for E3 that have been emailed into us from people that are on the webinar today. So what I suggest is that um, you just, if you're not really familiar with the company already, just, just wait until the presentation. I'll probably answer a lot of your questions. And then when we get into Q&A, if we don't ask something you're interested in, you can type it into the chat box then. Uh, so, so our speaker today is Chris uh, Dornbos. He is e CEO of E3 Metals. He founded the company in 2016. Uh, he is a petroleum geologist uh, and was formerly the CEO, director of Revere Development Corp and vice president of exploration for MinQuest Limited. He's an expert on developing major projects, both in Canada and across the globe. He has a strong technical background and has successfully driven projects through the development stages through to production using innovation and out of the box thinking. He has a long history of developing companies, both privately and in the public capital market. This includes developing, no, negotiating long, large corporate transactions, the sale and acquisition of mineral properties and strategic capital, capital raising. Uh, Chris emphasizes risk management, developing and managing an exceptional technical team and well-strategized project generation with a clear focus on developing and capturing value for shareholders. So Chris, uh, welcome to the EPG group and uh, take it away. It's all yours. Excellent. Thanks, Dan and Sabrina. Um, thanks for uh, having me on the on the, your your call today, guys. Uh, much appreciate it. Um, I really I like starting with this picture. This really emphasizes to me what E3 Metals is all about. So this is a picture taken of our project site this past fall uh, here in South Central Alberta, and I know there's a lot of um, oil and gas people on the call, oil and gas investors and professionals, um, and even some that are in Alberta. So this is just south of Red Deer in Alberta. Um, and what I really like about this is it exemplifies the project from um, an operational standpoint. And one of our the things that really set us apart from our peers in the space. So when you look at this, you see grid roads every mile, you see um, power lines, you see well, you don't see the, the natural gas pipeline, but there's natural gas running under this um, that takes the main trunk down to the United States from here. The other thing you can, if you look around, you see about eight oil and gas facilities. And what's interesting about the facilities is look there at their proximity to the farmhouses. And it really exemplifies the social license that we have here uh, in Alberta, uh, in Alberta. But aside from that, it also look, exemplifies the ability for the company to develop this project from an operational standpoint. And that's because operationally, removing oil uh, out, of, um, the, out of these aquifers and producing a product, operationally, it looks exactly like removing a lithium from the, from the brine. So in this, this is Leduc aquifer, about 98% of the brine uh, or of the fluid coming out of this, out of these wells here in the Duke, 
are uh, brine and the other 2% are oil. E3's project looks to take advantage of that. We're gonna go uh, much farther away from the oil and gas uh, in this aquifer and produce just the brine. But operationally, we'll be taking fluids out of the well, we'll be producing it at a battery, much similar to the oil and gas side of things. So from that standpoint, operationally, skill sets, um, social license, all of that exists here in Alberta. And it does set us apart um, purely on the fact that um, when you look at this from a permitting standpoint as well, as E3 grows the project, as we get closer and closer to production, the risk profile of this project starts to drastically go down. And that's pretty, um, pretty much the opposite of what a normal mining or mineral development project has in front of it, which is our peers in the space. And that is because we look more like an oil and gas project at the end of the day. We just produce lithium out of the back of our wells. So a um, couple of key highlights about E3. We recently released a preliminary economic assessment outlining a, a pre-tax 1.1 billion US uh, NPV with a 32% RRR. That's about 820 million after tax. Um, one of the big key pieces to note is our operating cost per ton, 3,656 US. That's one of the lowest of the low quartile. This is um, one of the best operating projects um, out there in, uh, in development. So when you look at it from a pricing perspective of lithium, the price is expected to go up and down and fluctuate over the next 10 years. The short term, you, we're gonna see a price spike most likely, currently selling for around 12 to 14,000 per ton, um, expected to see that rise in the short term. But when you look at this from the perspective of longevity, we're building a robust project here, um, a hard rock mine, which is where most of the lithium hydroxide comes from today. Uh, the operating costs are generally more than double th these costs here. So that will allow us to continue to make valuable products and, and value for shareholders as we get into the operation side, regardless of the price. Um, huge resource for this project, one of the seventh largest in the world. Um, and the big thing that we've been working on for the past four years is our DOE technology. Um, and it is now at the point where we're aiming to have that piloted by the end of this year, or early next. And we've opened up a facility here locally in Calgary that just opened in, on Feb 1. And that is where we will be designing and then eventually building this pilot. So very excited to have that just started. Uh, run by a very um, diverse and um, very, very good group of people at E3. Uh, John Pandazopoulos just joined us as a CFO. Uh, he's also director of the company, uh, oil and gas executive uh, in the junior oil and gas space, as well as from the banking side, worked for some of the bigger banks uh, in Canada. Liz and Rowan are the technical, the two heads of the technical departments, Liz on the geology and exploration and Rowan on the, um, on the lithium side. The company has been actively staffing. One of the big things you're gonna see us um, over the next month or two is bring on an even bigger um, and, uh, and grow this team uh, into the future. So um, from, from all angles, so we're looking at, um, corporately advisory roles and staff um, growing this company. So a um, couple of our key corporate advisors, uh, Kevin Reinhardt was an ex um, executive and the CEO of Nexon, which was purchased by CNOC back in 2013. Um, and from the technical side, uh, just point out Sean Preso, who is our, um, one of our technical advisors looking, and he works at BASF. Uh, and he used to work in their lithium ion um, battery cathode division. So really, really well supported on the advisory side as well. I'm not gonna spend too much time on the market today. Um, the growth in lithium um, and the thesis for a company like E3 Metals is really on the growth of the electric vehicle. And Lithium ion batteries get used in a lot of different applications and have for the for a very long time. But the quantity of lithium that goes into something like your cell phone or your computer is not that much, although that market is getting bigger. Um, 
where the, the quantity of lithium really starts to go is into the electric vehicle. So 68 kilograms on average per battery. And what that means is that as the electric vehicle market starts to increase, the market for lithium uh, grows very, very rapidly. And although a lot of people are talking about where lithium comes from, one of the big um, key pieces of this is that not all lithium is created equal. And if you're supplying a battery manufacturer, you need to be supplying better quality products. And most of the lithium made in the world, and, it's, and all of it up until you know, battery, lithium ion batteries became a thing, was not of that quality. And so for the company's ability to, from the very get-go, engineer our process to produce battery quality lithium hydroxide will set, set us apart. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on when I talk about our ESG side of things. But looking at it from the market perspective, as electric vehicles become more and more dominant um, in the uh, as, as transportation modes of transportation, um, the market for lithium does really start to move. Most people are predicting that that real movement is going to happen in around 2025, and that's driven by by the price parity. So right now, if you look at a consumer car. Um, Electric vehicles are still a bit more expensive. In the luxury cars, they've now probably hit price parity, like an uh, Audi A4 and a Tesla 3 are probably about the same price with the same options. Um, but when the mass consumer market really starts to pick up on this um, at price parity, that's where you start to see this move. Our project, we're aiming to get on just the front end of that wave as the demand really starts to pick up, there will be a lag in the supply and E3's goal is to have a product to the market in around 2024 to 2025 when that happens. Um, E3 has been um, is one of those companies that really sets goals and achieves them. Um, if you've been following the story for, for a while, and I know there's some people on this call that have been following it since we started in 2017. Um, you know, we started the company as a mineral exploration company. And Within a year, we had 6.7 million tons of lithium uh, outlined under infer resources. We pretty much spent the rest of the time since then developing our technology. That's time and energy and obviously capital as well. And hit it, hit, hitting some very uh, important milestones. Um, we've been able to produce lithium hydroxide. We brought Liven on as a partner. They helped us get to the point where we are today in terms of being able to pilot this technology. Um, we've made huge improvements on the efficiency of that, and that allowed us to put out a preliminary economic assessment that we released in uh, November and outlining the, a project with a value of over a billion dollars. So the company's come a long way, and I think you've seen that also um, exemplified in, in the value that the company has gone, and we're just starting to move from a, pardon me, from a value perspective. Um, this slide's a bit out of date. Um, the company, as of uh, today has raised uh, in the past uh, four months about $14.5 million. So a little bit on the preliminary economic assessment. Um, this is in here for your reference. Um, I'm not going to go through all the numbers. Again, one of the key things to note is the cash operating cost per ton. We did trade off a little bit with the capital um, to have a bit of a, 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 you know, a more streamlined operation. At the expense of a bit more capital, but I think it'll pay off because the short term uh, is anticipated to see a much higher price than the fourteen thousand dollars per ton that we used, uh, which we, um, which is sort of an industry um, average from twenty twenty five to twenty forty, is where that number came from. We anticipate a higher price in the short term, so twenty twenty five to say twenty thirty, and so. Even with the fourteen thousand, we're a three and a half year payback period. So if that price goes up, that payback period drops dramatically. We're able to pay off the initial capital. One of the key things to note about this, though, is that twenty thousand tons is just the starting point. So we did the PA based on um, a, a capital that we thought would be a nice number to be able to chew on for a company like us to get. Uh, initial production that created a lot of value for us. So that was where we got 20,000 tons. Um, that is not what the project can produce. Our estimates are that 
Um, you know, obviously this takes time to grow, but um, we can achieve a capacity of about 150,000 tons. And that 150,000 tons can run for about 35 years in total. So this is just the starting point. This is just phase one um, with this value of 820 million uh, after tax. E3 has three main competitive advantages that we like to talk about. Um, the first is the DLE. It is what has unlocked the value of this resource here in Alberta. It's what separates us from most of our peers um, is that we actually own this technology and we own the resource as well. So we're not shopping for clients or we're not shopping for a, a technology. We have both. And this technology is engineered for purity. And that's one of the key things about what we've been focusing on since 2017 is developing a technology that allows us to produce a very clean product because we want to sell this to the battery market because that's where the value is. If you make a, a battery quality product, you get paid for that at a higher premium than any other type of product. And if you're in a uh, hard rock mine or in a solar, this polishing step here is normally your biggest step. So if you're a solar, you're evaporating all the water off, you're concentrating lithium, but you're also concentrating everything else. And in a hard rock mine, it's, it's the same. If you're mining it, you make a hard rock concentrate, it has everything in it, including the lithium, and you have to then clean everything else up to get to the lithium. Whereas our process removes the lithium from the brine and only the lithium. So what that means is that we're able to remove over 99% of the impurities in one single step. And we're also able to concentrate lithium. And that is what has enabled us to produce or to aim to produce battery quality lithium hydroxide out of the back of our facility. And to use an analogy that you guys are probably mostly familiar with given the crowd, um, and it speaks really well in Alberta as well, is that you know what we produce our concentrate, what we call our licks, concentrate or lick solution, um, which has all the lithium in it and, um, and is concentrated from the original 80 milligrams per liter up to over 5,000. Um, that is like the crude oil. Um, the difference is, is that in the lithium market, there is no market for crude. Um, you have to make the gasoline. You have to go all the way to the final product. So E3 will also have the refinery, what we call a converter running in Alberta and we will produce battery quality lithium hydroxide from that. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the, the size of this resource, the 20,000 ton project that, we, that we've outlined in the PA is just a starting point. Um, we, have, we have an absolutely massive aquifer. If you guys are familiar with the Leduc, um, it's a carbonate reef and it is 99.5% brine. Um, and it was before they struck, Exxon struck oil in 1947. And it, it, this aquifer started the oil rush uh, in Alberta. Um, it's been very well delineated in exploration from the oil and gas industry. Very little production left. It's at the end of its development cycle for oil and gas, but it is um, just starting off for lithium. So the, the initial project is 20,000 tons. If you look at the size of this land, um, the dark blue shaded areas are the uh, resource areas. The white outlines are our permit uh, ground, which is just the, the edge of the Leduc aquifer. So even our resource can be expanded from 7 million tons and the project can also expand. So we have a huge opportunity once we get the initial project off and running to grow this into a world class lithium producer. If we're 150,000 ton producer today, we'd be the largest lithium producer on the planet. So this is a massive opportunity. And then Alberta, I mean, this is an oil and gas uh, project effectively. We just make lithium out of the back of it. And being in Alberta and having the uh, regulatory regime that we have and a very supportive government, our premier was tweeting about E3 metals just last week. Um, you know, we're gonna have, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of steps to go through to get your permits um, in any environment that you're in. But with the support of government behind you, I think that the risk for E3 metals on the permitting and social license standpoint is uh, quite a bit lower than our peers in the space. So I showed this diagram already. This is our, our process flow sheet. On the left side of this diagram is effectively oil and gas. 
The right side is traditional uh, lithium production. So what everyone would deploy if you're gonna make the battery called lithium hydroxide. So what bolts into the middle is our GLE technology. And that's the proprietary piece that we own. What it effectively is, is a water softener is the best way to describe it. It's an ion exchange medium. And as the lithium flows across it, the lithium sticks to it and only the lithium. And by the time the brine gets to the bottom of the tank, there's no more lithium in it. And we put that right back into the aquifer. So there's no tailings ponds, there's no settling, there's no surface ex uh, expression of this except for wells and pipes. Um, every so often the material fills up with lithium and you backwash it. That backwashing strips the lithium off and that's how we get our lit solution. And that's what we refine into um, better quality lithium hydroxide. Um, I won't go too much through this. I've already talked about Alberta quite a bit, um, but for your reference. One of the big things the company is aiming to do going forward is um, develop this from a zero emission standpoint. We have a huge opportunity in Alberta. And I was actually talking to Dan before the call started about um, the transition for you know, electric vehicles, electric vehicles don't, like the, the battery is just the gas tank, it's not the gasoline. So you still have to power the vehicle with something. And as the world starts to um, buy more electric vehicles and we start needing to charge those, we're gonna shift how we use hydrocarbons. But I, I'm not seeing, and I don't think anyone is, is out there saying that we're gonna stop producing hydrocarbons. We're just gonna use them differently. And one of the ways that we're using differently is we're going to start probably burning a lot more natural gas to generate electricity. And E3's project is going to be no different. Our electricity, which is 98 or 99% of the energy that the project will consume, is power. And so we're going to have a behind the fence uh, natural gas power facility where we will generate all electricity we need to run the electric submersible pumps for the, um, for the wells and the electrolysis system for the lithium hydroxide. The benefit to behind the fence uh, natural gas power is that we are in full control of our CO2. So we can use carbon sequestration to strip the CO2 out of the exhaust gas of the natural gas power plant, and we can put it into our waste stream that's injected back into the aquifer. And we know we can do this because about 10 kilometers down the road from our project, there's another company doing the exact same thing in this aquifer. So we know that it works. Um, we know that we can dispose of the CO2 into this aquifer. We can handle it. Um, and we also have the technology here in Alberta to, to do that. And so for us, that means that we would have a zero carbon product. And that would, in my opinion, and, and from what we're seeing in the market, have a huge impact on the ability for E3 to find customers. Um, everyone is out there searching for uh, zero impact products. So from the ESG standpoint, and if we're successful in this, we'll be the only company out there making anything close to this. And on the other side of the ESG is, you know, our surface impact. So we don't have, a, you know, tailings. We don't consume fresh water. In fact, we actually produce fresh water. The last step in the process is uh, taking a slurry of lithium hydroxide and turning it into a salt because lithium hydroxide is effectively just a salt. And that is an evaporation process. We actually produce a, a distilled, effectively freshwater stream that we can provide to the local communities for things like uh, agriculture and, and farming. Um, so, and then also the land use. So our goal for the project is no net disturbance. So going to old facility locations in Alberta um, that people are in the process of dismantling and taking them on um, to produce lithium from. One of the advantages there is that if they're permitted, there is an, a, there could be the ability for us to just transfer the permit um, and get it uh, switched over to a lithium production permit, um, which would also even more so uh, reduce our um, permitting timeframe. And I think that the government would be very supportive of that move, given what we've, the conversations we've had so far. So that's another goal for us. Um, I'll leave this in here for reference. This is just outlining the different ways to make um, lithium you know, the hard rock conventional and, and solars. Um, DLE is now becoming more and more so the, the pr uh, predominant new production sources of lithium. And in my opinion, in 10 years, 
the majority of new sources of lithium coming on on stream in the real world sense will be daily, pardon me, daily sources such as ours. This is a picture of Standard Lithium's pilot plant. A lot of you are probably familiar with the Standard. Um, they're a good peer comparison for us, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is their pilot plant. Um, a picture of it in the in the fabrication yard um, that they published. So the reason that we use um, Standard as a comparison is because they're a little bit ahead of us. So they're probably 12 to 18 months ahead of us in terms of their development timeframe. So they are currently in the process of piloting their DLE technology in Arkansas. And they partnered with Lanxys to make that happen. Um, a couple of key things that are similarities, we both use a DLE process. Um, we both make a, a very high pure product because that process allows us to do so uh, much more simply. Uh, we both have fairly large resources, of those, although E3s is, is um, still quite a bit bigger. Um, a couple of the differences, we have a bit lower grade. Um, the process that we've developed is developed by us. So we actually own all of the intellectual property around the material itself. Um, we also uh, own our resource. And that's a huge difference. So Standard Lithium, uh, our joint venture into their resource with Lanxys. There's some advantages to that because standard, or sorry, Lanxys is on the hook for some of the construction. Um, but at the end of the day, the enterprise value of E3 is going to be substantially higher because we retain 100% of the ownership. But one of the other big things to note is the valuation of the two companies. Um, E3 is, like I said, about 12 to eight months behind and we're worth about a quarter to a third of what standard is worth. And I think it, what it does is it paints the roadmap of where E3's value is gonna to continue to grow over the next you know, 12 months. And especially in, I think in the next six, as we demonstrate some of the key pieces of this project um, as we get going. And as I, as I mentioned before, we've recently raised about $14.5 and million. And I'll take you through that, what we're gonna use that for. So um, in October, December, and uh, this past in February, last week, we raised a total aggregate of 14 and a half million. Um, that capital is, um, we're just, you know, getting started, I should say, um, in deploying that capital. So we're hiring um, pretty mad right now. We've got five new hires starting in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll probably add a few more staff uh, after that. We've opened up our facility in Calgary that opened Feb 1. So the company is going through a very dramatic uh, maturation as we shift from a you know, exploration developer to sort of a developer on the way to a, a producer. So um, the first thing that that uh, capital is being deployed towards is the DLE process. So the lab is geared towards um, finalizing the development and then designing and then constructing um, the pilot. So we want to actually build the field pilot We'll build a prototype, make sure that it's working, and then we'll, we'll hire a fabrication company to manufacture it for us. Um, the most likely scenario is that that will be something that you'll be able to buy. The inner core of it will be the, the ion exchange piece, <clears throat> pardon me, will be more so off the shelf. Um, and then we'll bolt around it sort of the, um, the Alberta infrastructure required to tie it into the local infrastructure. Uh, a big advantage is that we have brine at surface today from the production of oil and gas. So there is a little bit of oil and gas still being produced. Um, so we're able to uh, utilize that and run our pilot. Um, the other piece that we're going to be working on is the aquifer management plan. And what that really means is, is a measured and indicated resource upgrade. And what, that, what happens with that is um, it's a production test. So we just go down to an existing well, which is the other piece of this, Alberta, there's become a bit of a problem with uh, companies going bankrupt over the past five years and orphaning wells. And if you're familiar with Alberta, you'll see this talked about a lot in the news um, where wells get orphaned and the, the province is on the hook to clean them up. And one of the things that E3 is looking at is looking at that orphan well list or talking to um, operators who have wells that they are looking to abandon and a combination of the two allowing us to reduce the infrastructure that is required to run this project. And one of the ways we'll do that is um, there are wells available in our area 
um, for the production testing and to develop this project on without having to drill any development well. So there's no drilling required to do the uh, MI upgrade, um, assuming we can get access to these wells. Um, and that has a huge, uh, obviously, reduction in capital spend. The last piece that we'll be working on in 2021 is the production of lithium hydroxide. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we have a very pure concentrate out of the DLE tech, our lick solution, and that goes through conventional lithium processing. So there is a, another cleanup stage to get it to the 99.999, 59 purity, and then we, um, we electrolyze it into a lithium hydroxide. That technology is out in the market. We're just going to spend the year testing various different uh, vendors and find a solution that we like the best and then we'll be deploying that. The goal is to have lithium hydroxide made in uh, consistently, still small amounts, but consistently made by the end of this year so that we can start uh, customer discovery. So start sending that product to the battery manufacturers, the OEMs, um, so that they can start testing it and put us on their list as a potential supplier. Um, so E3, uh, share price we're trading about, a, I think we closed Friday 320. As I mentioned, we've got about $14.5 million uh, in the bank. Um, we are uh, 52 high, obviously COVID. Um, that 19 cents was, you know, March 18. I think everybody was down. So that was our COVID low. And then um, we're trading uh, upwards at the moment. And um, from what we've seen in the market, I think that this is the value that E3 has 157 million market cap, 160 million. Um, we're still uh, about a third of our uh, relative to our peers. So, still lots of room to move. And our, our, we've kept our capital structure pretty tight over the past couple of years. So, we only have 50 million shares on issue as of right now. Um, and uh, I think that that. With, with the capital we've just recently raised, that's obviously including all of that. Um, so we don't we don't expect to need to raise capital until we have the pre-feasibility study done on the project next year. So a, a lot of huge milestones that the company is anticipating hitting over the next 12 to 18 months. And I think that that is gonna see three uh, continue to uh, accrete value as we go. All right, so that is the end of the presentation. Uh, Dan, if you guys want to open it up for, for questions. All right, Chris, you can hear me, I'm back online. Yep. All right, uh, yeah, I've got a long list of questions that were submitted to us by email. So if you guys are online, I, I see there's three or four more questions that have been typed into the chat room, but you might wait uh, now because I, I think these questions going over them are gonna cover about everything we possibly talk about. Um, I'll start with Damien sending in some questions here. Uh, he said the reason private placement was 8 million. Uh, how long until E3 metals is funded? I think you pretty much answered that question. But so the, the 14 or so million you got in the bank, that'll carry you through to this year through next year or what? That's correct. Yeah. Into 2022. Okay. Okay. When and then his next question is: When is E three Metals expected to initiate negotiations with off takers of the lithium? And have you already been approached by any of the people that are actually going to take the produced lithium? Yeah, we've got some pretty strong relationships uh, across the globe. Um, there's not a lot of battery manufacturing in Canada, so all of our um, you know business development activities have been focused overseas. So Korea. South Korea specifically um, and Europe, um, and now a bit more into the US. Um, and definitely, like uh, before COVID, we were traveling to South Korea on a regular basis, uh, meeting with some of the largest um, companies there. So that process has definitely started. Um, and, and again, that goal of us producing the hydroxide is driven by those relationships. Okay. Is it is that the plant you're uh, building now that came online like in February? Is is it going to produce samples that these guys can test the quality of it? Um, that's the goal. So okay. we're like, we just opened it up in on Feb one, right? So it, right now everything is just being put together. We spent the last two weeks um, fitting the lab. And so uh, tomorrow the team gets started on getting to work effectively. So, okay, good. Yeah. So it's going to uh, take some time, but 
um, you know, two, three months and we'll have um, some pretty strong results to show from it because uh, yeah. they're, they're pretty much picking up where, uh, where we left off uh, just before Christmas. So we've just taken the month to get this, this facility going. Okay. His next question is about milestones. That's obviously a big milestone. Yeah. So once they, once they agree that you're with him has a quality that they want, that's makes it really a live situation. Yeah. Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, we talk a lot about the DLE technology because it's the enabler. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're going to have, we're going to have, we have a product. We're going to have to find customers for our product. I think that, if we're able to demonstrate uh, a true zero carbon product, I, there's gonna be no issues with even trying uh, preferential customers um, from my perspective, from the conversations that we're having already mm -hmm. um, with those potential purchasers. Um, and we plan to, to do that independently uh, verified. So we're gonna have a, an LCA, a life cycle analysis, a uh, third party report completed probably early 2022. It's not really, you know, it, it is more so for customers mm -hmm. um, to have that document in their hands to say, yes, and a third party company has verified that this, these are the parameters by which our ESG uh, sits. So we're not greenwashing this project. We're simply developing it in a way that, um, you know, has, has good social governance and environmental sustainability. Yeah, very important these days. Uh, there are several yeah. questions about your relationship with Livent Corp. Uh, so why don't you just address that? And then there's one at the end that says, is there any chance of them coming back in as, as a partner or something? Yeah, look, we had a great relationship with Live End. Um, they came in at a time when it was very difficult to raise capital on the market um, in 2019. And, um, you know, they brought um, cash, which was very hard to find, but more importantly, they brought expertise. And so... We worked with them for you know a little over a year, getting the technology to where it is today. Um, working at our facility in Kingston, Ontario, and their facility in North Carolina, and you know they withdrew. What Paul Graves told me uh, is is the focus had changed on developing um, the project with Namaska, and you know the capital that they were continuing to contribute on the project wasn't that great. But I think more so what the, the real push behind it was focus for, for Livent. Um, because they didn't just uh, suspend E3 uh, and withdraw from E3's project. They also uh, suspended their own development on Umber Merito in South America, so in Argentina. So it was, a, I think, from my perspective, and this is just me speaking, because um, I, I don't work for Livent, but from what I was told, uh, it was it was a focus shift. They needed their expertise that they had deployed the E3's project back because they're responsible for getting the Masters project technically off the ground as well. So, oh, okay. but we got from them um, what we needed when we needed it. You know, effectively it was a two point two million dollar Canadian grant with expertise, right? Um, because they they don't hold anything in E3 anymore, um, and they uh, and they we we received all the intellectual property back as well. So they have no involvement with E3 anymore. Now, having said that, going forward, you know, there is a potential. We still have a good relationship with them, um, but there's been nothing to date. And, and, you know, obviously conversations still continue. So, okay. Nothing okay. Yeah. Uh, we're very familiar with uh, joint ventures in the oil and gas industry. I'll tell you. That. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And this was a great one for us. Like they, yeah, they, they yeah. brought a lot to the table and they helped us out significantly. So we're, you know, we're nothing, it's disappointing that uh -huh. they withdrew, but we withdrew from the project. We have nothing bad to say. Okay. Uh, okay. This one's from Amika. And uh, cool. before I ask a question, I'll tell everybody that uh, the stock closed the venture exchange on Friday at $3.20 Canadian. So she asked, uh, she says, E3 is trading as a penny stock in quotes which means that at certain limitations, uh, such as you cannot uh, buy it on margin. Uh, so uh, does the stock, do you have to uplist to another exchange so that you could buy it on margin? Yeah, and I, I you sent me that email, Mika, so I apologize for anything back to you. Um, yeah. the, the answer to that is that we're, we're a venture, we're on the venture exchange, and that's the reason why you can. So there are plans, uh, for E3 to uh, move off the venture um, to the main board and, and potentially even list 
on one of the main boards in the US uh, in the coming in the future um, as uh, you know as we, we sort of graduate to that level and it's a very common process you start a small company on the venture and eventually you get to the point where you meet the criteria to list on the main board and e3 now hits that criteria so we're just it's just a matter of time before we make the move but it's a it's a methodical thing to do you know there's um um you know you go through the process of of the switch when the time is right and i think that time is is coming pretty quick but and we're working on it uh uh, the next question is from Roy, and it has to do with, you know, the new Biden administration, and obviously that's going to create some changes. Uh, so he asked, given the recent ongoing challenges in the oil sector in Alberta, as illustrated by President Biden's administration, cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline example, uh, do you anticipate an increased desire on the part of the Alberta government to achieve more economic diversification through the projects such as yours? And to that, what specific measures would you hope the Alberta government to take to help your uh, project reach production? Yeah, I mean, I think all of Alberta was a bit disappointed with the Keystone decision. Um, no, I don't think all that surprised. Um, it, it seems that this happens uh, when the change of government happens. So, um, but still no less disappointing um, for the province. Um, I think that the government has been on a diversification bend for some time before this decision was made. Um, you know, the energy minister uh, who regulates lithium, but also oil and gas came to our office in September to announce a program to look at streamlining permitting for uh, mineral development. And um, so we've been working with the government through a, a panel that they formed um, to, you know, advise on that from our perspective, we provide our perspective to that. And so we anticipate some regulatory uh, changes coming that will help streamline the process. That's their goal is to streamline it. So, um, you know, and, and the premier was tweeting what E3 from an, a news article that, uh, that we were featured in last week. So I think that there's not a lot of places where the premier will, will tweet directly about your, your company and your project. So I think that we're obviously on their radar um, I can't speak to, you know, the, the direct implications, obviously, because um, that is the prerogative of the government, but the, the support is certainly there. Mm -hmm. uh, for my two cents worth on President Biden, I was asked this on my last webinar directly. Uh, he's getting a lot of pressure uh, from his own party over that decision to uh, shut down the Keystone XL pipeline, obviously costs a lot of jobs. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to bring that back online, including the fact that oil prices are going to rise significantly uh, in the near future. So people aren't going to like paying three or four dollars a gallon for gasoline. And that kind of applies some pressure. Anyway, moving on uh, a guy from Robert here. He says, my interest as a very recent investor stems from other investments in lithium and graphite. He said, is the brine that you're uh, is it produced in other uh, oil fields? Uh, it is it is not common to have this amount of lithium in mm -hmm. uh, oil field brines. It is it is out there though. There are um, other brines uh, in the back of oil and gas production that do produce lithium. Um, and you know it's one of the one of the things that E three has been you know working on in the background is uh, those the other potentials as well to grow the company. Um, the benefit to the technology that we've developed is that it's specifically developed for this type of brine. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I can't say definitively that it would work on any brine chemistry because it's a chemical process. And so the chemistry of the brine itself does have an impact. Um, but, you know, from everything we've seen and the, the testing we've done outside our brine, it, it does seem to work no matter what. So um, there's a, there is a big opportunity for licensing this technology or, or uh, partnering or even acquiring other projects. And that's another avenue of business development the company is, is working on, but obviously a lot of that ends up, you know, remaining quite uh, under wraps until, it, uh, until it's finalized. Yeah, I would think you'd have to be careful giving out the technology. So you don't want to- Yeah, we wouldn't give it out. We would, we would license the right to use this right. piece of it. You know yeah. what I mean? To, yeah. So if someone had a brine and they wanted to produce 
lithium, we would look at at that license as a royalty or something like that. Yeah, but from the, the size of your project, you definitely have enough to keep you busy for decades to come, it sounds like. Exactly. And that's why we like our main focus has been on on our project because we have such a huge opportunity in Alberta to do this here. Um, but you know, we do want to see the company grow and part of that growth is, you know, on the uh, mergers acquisition side. Yeah, and I think some of his other questions have to do with um, can this uh, lithium extraction process be part of cleaning up old wells? Uh, and by the way, when so what is your economic interest in that oil field? And are you are you considered the working interest owner? I mean, do you have plugging liability for those wells? No, no, we're not the working interest owner uh, okay. or operator on any of the oil and gas infrastructure. Okay, so that oil field is under current operations, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're just gonna you're just gonna take their produced water. Exactly, and we've just we just developed very strong relationships with these operators because right. Um, we offer them an opportunity. They this is at the end of its of its hydrocarbon life cycle. Like it's been producing since the '40s. So. Oh yeah, it's a huge field. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's so, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure in place, and the the, the company. Or companies that own that infrastructure are on the hook, obviously, to reclaim it. And, you know, there's some questions in the chat that I can address as well. They're talking about going into old oil wells can be problematic. And you're absolutely right. Um, for us, we look at this as a, from a cherry pick perspective, which mm -hmm. is there are some recent wells that are in very good shape that we would love to take on. Um, the big thing that we'd probably do is turn them into disposal wells. So we have to develop a disposal system as well as a production system, the likelihood is that we'll drill new wells in a commercial scenario um, to, for the production of the brine. But what we're going to try to repurpose as many as we can uh, from existing into the injection. Okay. And what that does is it actually gives enhanced oil recovery potential to the operators. They might actually get more oil out of, out of the aquifer in that area and also we don't really want to be where the oil and gas is it's a very small percentage of the aquifer um it's the top 10 meters and it's maybe a kilometer wide and a 40 kilometer wide um uh, reef mm -hmm. but um we just we don't want to see oil come through the system so we'll go to where there's no oil we'll produce just the brine but then we can we have a, a potential disposal area oh okay i see yeah yeah you want to be above the oil and gas line all right um, he says, what's, uh, in addition to raising capital, what are some other problems? What are your greatest challenges you see going forward in the next couple of years? Yeah, I think capital is definitely something that we've ticked off the list as, as a risk overcome. So, um, right now it's the next risk is the daily technology and, and demonstrating that it works in the pilot. And the reason the pilot is so, uh, important to us is that. In an ion exchange system, it's a tank full of your chemical, the chemical that we've developed. And, and like I said, it is like a water softener. And if you have a water softener in your house, you know, there, it's just those little beads that you're putting in a tank. And so from getting that out uh, to a commercial, from here, where we are today, to a commercial plant, the pilot is going to be one full-size commercial tank, effectively, right? So you will we'll build one tank it'll have the a capacity to extract a certain amount of lithium on a daily and yearly basis and we'll test it in the field and you know iron out all the kinks and get it operating on real brine real life scenario um and then once that happens uh when we go to commercial we're just building probably 50 or 60 of those same tanks right so what it allows us to do is scale very at a very low risk uh, scenario because um, you know each each of these tanks will have the same capacity and you know then it just becomes a brine handling exercise and that's something that we know any oil and gas um, operator knows how to move water so um, you know it's something we do very well in Alberta and uh, and we see as very low risk so it's just it is just getting this DLE technology piloted. And then I think that the rest of it is just normal sort of course of business for a developing project to get to commercial operations. Okay, uh, the next questions are from Ryan. Um, I think you answered the one about repurp 
repurchase, repurposing existing wells for brine production because you're going to drill new wells deeper into the formation so you're below the oil uh, oil uh, gas contact points, and and then you're going to uh, change some of the producers into injection wells. So you inject the water in the upper part of the zone, which will increase the pressure and help them uh, produce more oil and gas. Sounds like a good plan. <laughs> Uh, ha has E3 secured the surface locations for the pilot plant or for the Clearwater project yet? Uh, no, but we will not actually secure our own location. So we're working with a couple of operators, like I said, um, who already have production going. And um, so we've identified three potential sites and are working with the operators um, to make that happen. So do you get the surface, so do you, uh, you lease that from the surface owners? Yeah, I mean, for the pilot, we're not leasing anything. We will just use their lease. We will come on okay. with a mobile pilot, uh, at least like skid mounted or something, and we'll just tie it into their disposal stream. Okay, okay. So fairly simple. It's it's a very minor, it's a what they call an Alberta plot plan amendment. So it's not a huge um, permit required. Uh, it's, it's a submission takes a couple of weeks to get approved um, to have it basically because it's treated like a service vehicle. Okay. Okay. Um, because it will be mobile. Plus you're, so you're in an area where the surface and mineral owners are very friendly to the, to the yes. industry. So it shouldn't be any problem. I would think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like even this picture, this is our project site. We've got wind farms beside yeah. farmhouses, beside oil and gas infrastructure. Right. Money right. talks, man. When you when you need surface, you'll get it. <laughs> what what uh, the next questions come from Leonard? Uh, what is the status of the test plant? You said it's it started up in uh, February first, and you're staffing now. How long would it be before operations results are reported? From the pilot? For, yeah, from the yeah pilot project, I guess. The test. He says the test plant in Calgary. Yeah, so it's it's a test facility. Um, you know where we will build the pilot okay um the pilot prototype and then you know as the design basis for the fab yard that will build actual pilot um it's i mean it's operational now we're going to start to see results in the next couple months so we'll have stuff to the market um as these guys get ramped up and um so and it's you're just going to see continual progression of uh development of the process um we're going to be talking about um you know moving on to the pilot prototype we'll have we'll probably get some pictures out obviously nothing too close up but you know we'll, there'll be a lot of information as we progress and we hit these milestones towards the, the prototype and once the prototype's done you know the, the next step is really just fabricating the actual pilot itself so there's okay. not a lot of um you know all the risk and all the, the sort of kinks have already been hammered out and we're just building something that uh, can legally go out into the field. Okay. So uh, it, his next question is, if the test results are favorable, what's the timeline for a commercial plant uh, would be commissioned? Yeah, so we're, we're aiming for the pre-feasibility mid-2022. And I think that that's really construction decision for the company. Okay. Um, the next step after that, and it's a little bit different than some of the peers in our space that have released PFS pre-feasibilities, um, because... Our, the the pre-fees that we're going to complete will be basically feed, if people use that terminology. So mm -hmm. um, at the end of it, we'll have um, basically the design nailed down and we'll be going into detailed engineering design to, for the construction. So um, it is really truly for us construction decision point. And then we'll be going to secure funding as we complete the detailed engineering design. And, uh, and then as soon as we have to complete shovels in the ground. So, okay. are, yeah. Are you going to have to issue more shares uh, to build the fund the plant construction? The, the actual commercial operation? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not exactly. I, I would say we would try not to do it with equity. I think we would likely try to do a combination of debt financing mm -hmm. and you know potentially some capital for some off takes, off take rights. Mm -hmm. um, we see co companies pay um, suppliers for their off for a, an offtake contract. And the benefit of that is that you have cash, but you also have a locked in contract that you can take to a bank um, as a as security against, you know, whatever debt financing that you require. So I, I 
that would be my my most likely sort of path at this point mm -hmm. that we can see to financing the capital construction. Okay, okay, that uh, completes the questions I got emailed and I'll get to the ones that were entered into the chat box now. Okay, my first set of questions is from Gary G. Uh, I think Chris answered your first question about the timeline for key activities in 2021. So we'll skip that. Uh, the recent PEA an analysis is sensitive to the price of lithium. Uh, the recent PA used a future average selling price of $14,079 a ton of lithium hydroxide for this analysis. Does Chris still feel confident the price of lithium will be at or higher than that when they go into production in 2024, 25? Well, who yeah, knows, I, but yeah. <laughs> I think that, that look, it's the, the lithium market's a bit of a weird one. There's no, uh, you know, West Texas index for lithium it doesn't that's or london metals exchange there's no right um every, all the lithium sold directly to your supplier through direct sale contracts and they're not public so lithium prices are reported but i would say that they're, they're not 100 percent accurate um, and they don't reflect necessarily the battery quality products that are being sold so you know there's been some recent reporting by other peers in the space that follow these um you know, people, you know, quote unquote, lithium experts, but people who actually follow these contracts and, and have relationships. Oh, I mean, the price of lithium hydroxide at battery grade never get below 14,000. Never get below 14. And um, the price that did dip is, is you know, the, the impurity, impure products that had to be further refined. Um, that's anecdotal. That's not our, uh, our analysis. But what it demonstrates is that there's there is a lot of uh, opaqueness to the to the supply contracts, and ours will be no different. You know, we will likely not announce the terms uh, of the detailed terms of an of an off tape agreement, likely because they will not be that would be part of the agreements we do not. So um, they would be only disclosed to like the banks and stuff like that. So um, I think that it's it's a pretty uh, realistic, if not somewhat conservative price, especially into 2025 to 23. Yeah. And I can see, how, you know, a lot of it's going to depend on the quality of your lithium mm -hmm. and also the volumes that you're going to guarantee to them and stuff like that. So all it's that a stuff. lot like the oil, oil business is like that too. All yeah, oil exactly. is not the same. <laughs> yeah. So. And, and, you know, the other side of it is, again, I, I'm, the ESG is, is important and it's, it's important mm -hmm. because that's what the funds are funding right now. It's important because when we're looking at strategic partners, I know there's a question about strategic partner, Ether is in discussions with other strategics. And part of those discussions are about the ESG side of things, as well as the people who are big on our product will be judging us and probably paying us based on the ESG side of things. So it is a very important metric that I think all companies that are developing projects like this need to be at least cognizant of mm -hmm. um, because it's where the money is. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Sandy and she says, uh, your timeline kind of coincides with the development of solid state battery technology. Uh, I guess, are you worried about competition from solid state batteries in the next three to five years? Um, most solid state batteries use, uh, are, are still lithium based. Mm -hmm. Um, and at least all the ones that I've seen that are, you know, prevalent and, and have a, a chance of becoming a sort of a commercialized tech. Um, so, you know, it might change the types of product we make, but we're already in discussions with some of the solid state battery manufacturers who are piloting their own technology, right? And it, there's a really nice sort of synergy there because as they pilot their tech um, and we're developing our process, we can, you know, work together to get a product um, that they can use. But when you look at this from the standpoint of, of all the gigafactories that are being built in the world, um, you know, there is going to be a huge market for lithium ion, um, even as solid state become more prevalent. Yeah, it's a big market. People need to it's understand. It's a big market. And, it's a and huge market. It's, they still use lithium. So, you know, it, we might make uh, a lithium metal. We might make other uh, precursor lithium products, um, but we'll still be making lithium. 
Okay. Then the next question comes from Michael. And I think it's uh, he's in Europe, and he said there's an ASX listed company in Europe named Vulcan Energy, and they intend yeah. to produce mm -hmm. lithium. Yeah, from uh, Brian. And uh, do you see patent issues with them or anything? Well, they don't. They don't actually own their technology, so no, I don't. Um, okay. They're they're using a third party's tech, um, and I, I'm not exactly certain how much. Um, how, how detailed that has been in terms of their development on it. Uh, I know they released a PFS um, that sort of outlined a bit of information that they did some testing, but yeah, no, our, our, pro our process is ours. So, um, and we have patents. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not specifically concerned about patents or, or Vulcan. Even. Okay, there's quite a few more questions here. We're kind of at the end of our hour. I don't want to go too much longer, but I'll scan through these real. I mentioned at the end. Maybe I can I can see these here. Uh, okay, Maybe go ahead just, if you want to just go down. Yeah, there. I'll just take a couple of ones off we haven't talked about. Um, so, um, question about how the brine is being transported. So it's going to be through pipeline, very similar to how you move oil and gas in short distances. So. If you look at this picture, littered underneath the ground here are pipelines moving hydrocarbon production from all the wells that you see to a central facility where they take the oil out and then they pipe it to another place where they put the brine back into the aquifer. Our process will be similar in that design concept. So we'll be moving it around the underground pipeline in short distances. So nothing like the Keystone, but more just local. Um, 86 milligrams per liter is enough. Our PEA was actually uh, the economics are based on 75 milligrams per liter. So yes, it's more than enough to make a project economic based on technology. Um, so uh, a question about the past warrants. Um, they, the, the cap structures on a previous slide, it's also on the website. Um, a lot of the warrants uh, that we had outstanding uh, have now been exercised, the previous ones prior to these recent placements. Um, yeah, I'm just see if there's, there's the solid state question. Um, a question about Fox Creek. Um, yeah. So the question is, does Alberta's Fox Creek meet the requirements for DLE? I mean, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a lithium brine. Um, potentially could be, our technology could be deployed and most likely work. Um, the question also asks about higher grade lithium. I think that for the most part, um, you know, higher grade lithium has been found across Alberta. Um, but when you actually look at it from what has been sampled, I think the Fox Creek actually samples a lower concentration than E3's project. Um, in a modern sense. Um, so question from Sandigan, uh, LEC has experienced uh, substantial enterprise value growth in the past year. Do you foresee similar growth trajectory for E3 uh, given its cost effective quality in production? Um, yeah, I mean, LEC is definitely, I think they're worth like 3 billion or something like that. So um, they're worth more than producers of lifting products and they haven't produced anything. Um, but they have seen huge growth because they have the potential to be a, a major uh, supplier of lithium products. And I, I feel that E3 has a very similar trajectory, at least in terms of the path. You know, I think that we will see extreme growth as we develop our project and we get closer and closer to that sort of point. Um, and I think that for us, you know, like our standard lithium is. Uh, over 500 million, um, lac is 3 billion. You know, we reached lithium's value today, uh, it would be a $10 share price and worth trading $3. So, yeah, there's a lot of room, I think, for this to move. Um, and I think the last question um, what is the focus on ESG uh, and expectations of capital investment markets? I think I've answered that. Okay. Um, I, the goal for us is to reduce our total footprint. So it's not just about carbon. It's, it's across the board, just reducing the footprint, the, the impact 
as on a global sense. Um, so yeah, and, and hydrogen natural gas mix, of course, that is part of the uh, the facility is going to going to be uh, you know sort of a very efficient unit operator. So okay, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, uh, yeah, th I want to thank everybody for uh, signing on to this, and this is one of our largest attended webinars. Uh, I will tell you that we have recorded this event. Uh, we'll you know trim off the front and back a little bit, and then we're gonna. Uh, send it out and it goes out as a, U a YouTube uh, recording and it goes out to our members first and we have a global membership uh, which we probably only had 10% of our membership on this call so that'll get a lot more exposure and uh, then after it's on YouTube after it's out there as a private uh, recording for 30 days then it goes public and we have and then so anybody that uh, Google's E3 Metals Corp uh, this will come up uh, for them. And we've had some of our pre previous webinars. Yeah, have one have one has been uh, seen by 2,500 and their stock price is like quadrupled. So uh, it gets a lot of exposure for the companies. Anyway, uh, thank you for attending. We will send you a link to the recorded event. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.